I'll unmute myself and that'll help everyone out. We're going to be in Isaiah 49 today. Marshall opened up this sermon series for us last week. Uh, this is our Easter series, and it's going to be, or, or it is, on the servant song. So inside of Isaiah, there are a number of passages where Isaiah talks about the servant, the servant of the Lord, and this is our second that we're going to do. Now, when we talk about the servant of the Lord, there's some discrepancy on who that servant is. Generally, not a discrepancy amongst Orthodox evangel evangelical Christian groups, um, but believers in Christ are not the only people who study the Scripture and ancient literature. And, and so amongst the Jews, secular uh, scholars, there's a, a bit of a discrepancy. And when we talk about the servant, there are really three options. And I could, I could very well come at it and just say, hey, listen, the servant is Jesus, and don't worry about the rest of it. They're wrong. And there are probably some who would say, uh, I don't really feel like looking into it too much. Um, pastor says it, so we'll just go with that. Uh, but that's not a firm foundation in Scripture. I, I don't want this church to stand firmly in its faith because you took everything that I told you as truth. I want this church to stand firm in its foundation because we are biblically literate as individuals and as a congregation, and we're capable to open the Scripture and examine it for ourselves and not just believe what is told us. So this is how we're going to handle it this morning. A lot of this uh, Marshall alluded to last week, but we're going to look into what the three options are for the servant and why Christ is the best option. It might feel a little bit like a seminary course at the beginning, um, but that's okay. That's okay. In order for us to really celebrate and really worship, there has to be, even in our minds, a level of convincing and understanding. And so I want to take some time, the first half of this message, and just lay the foundation. So our three options for the servant are this, Israel as the body, the people that God called up out of Egypt and gave the promised land to, they are an option. Isaiah, the author of the passage, is an option, and a future Messiah that we will identify as Jesus is an option. Now, why are these all options? Well, at one point, he is going to say, you are my servant, Israel. And so those who would say that Israel is the servant are going to say, how much more do you need? Other times, we're going to have Isaiah, for the most part, speaking in terms of I and me. Those who would propose that this is Isaiah are going to say, well, it seems quite obvious. But I think we're going to see inside of both of those arguments that there are a number of things that don't fit historically that don't fit theologically, that tell us there must be something more. So let's start in verse, 40, uh, verse 1 of chapter 49, where it begins by saying, Listen to me, O coastlands. Marshall pointed out last week that when Isaiah talks about the coastlands, what he is saying is those on the outside, those on the fringes. Israel, as we're going to talk about later, is very much identified with the land, the land that God gave to them, the promised land that is the greatest sign of their covenant. And so the coastland being those lands outside of that. So when he says, O oh, coastlands, give your attention, he's talking to you. And he's talking to me, those who are, and unless, of course, you're Jewish by ethnicity, he is talking to us, those who are outside of that covenant promise that he made with the Jews. He is calling us to pay attention, the peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb. From the body of my mother, he named me. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. In the shadow of his hand, he hid me. He made me 
a polished arrow in his quiver, he hid me away. And he said to me, you are my servant, Israel, in whom I will be glorified. But I said, I have labored in vain. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity. Yet surely my right is with the Lord, and my recompense is with my God. Now, for those who would suggest that this is speaking to, or speaking of Isaiah, Isaiah speaking of himself, there's, there's something grammatically that makes sense there, but, but here's a bit of a historical problem that, that takes place here. You see, at the very beginning, he says, from the womb, he was named. But you remember Isaiah chapter 6. You remember in Isaiah chapter 6 when he is called up to the presence of the Lord and he is standing there in the throne room and as he looks and realizes where he is, he says, woe to me. Woe being this amazing form of, of just despair, being undone. He says, woe to me because I am a man of unclean lips and I live amongst the people of unclean lips and I'm in the presence of the Lord. And then the angel comes down and touches his lips and he's cleansed. And the Lord says, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah says, here am I, send me. Now the charge here is that whomever the servant is, was the servant at the point of the womb. While they were being formed in the womb, they were set apart and ordained as that servant, but we understand in Isaiah that he is called much later as an adult before he, he heeds that warning. So historically, it doesn't really fit. And then there's a second issue that I also think comes from Isaiah chapter 6. In it, he says, in the presence of the Lord, woe to me. He looks at the presence of the Lord and says, I do not belong here. Yet whomever it is that is the servant says, despite the fact that my work has not produced the fruit that it was expected in verse 4, yet surely my right is with the Lord. My right. Not a gift of grace or mercy, but a right. To me, it doesn't feel like Isaiah's attitude toward his position with God. It feels like an overstatement, a claim of something that Isaiah doesn't claim in other places. And now the Lord says, verse 5, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. Now, some who support the Israel theory might say, all of this is figurative, the form in the womb and all that kind of stuff. That's, that's talking about when he first calls Abraham and, and Israel is formed in that sort of early state, and so it still to this point very much fits with the narrative of Israel, and this could very well be Israel that is the servant, but when we read verse 5, we realize the servant is a savior, and Israel is the one being saved, not saving themselves. They're the ones that's to be called, to be gathered. How is it that Israel would gather herself and, and that not be explicitly mentioned. So it has to be that this servant is someone else. Also, in that camp would be the identification, like I said earlier, of the, the direct identification, you are my servant Israel. And, and just to, to back up a bit, I would say that summation, that totality of Israel, Isaiah never would have called himself Israel, the embodiment of of Israel. That would be too much. So what we end up with then is a need for another option. And this option is going to come to us 
through a, a study that we call typology. All right? Typology, it sounds bigger than it is. Ology, the study of and type, types of things. Right? Things come in different forms along the way. And, and so what we're looking at in typology is the, the same kind of thing that you would have when an invention comes to market. Right? By the time we see things on the shelves, they have been through an entire process. And when they come on the shelf, it is polished and painted and advertised in such a way that it looks sleek and elegant and exciting. And we say, I want that thing. But when these things are first crafted, I, in my mind, I'm, I'm particu particularly thinking about electronics. They often begin on a table in unpainted steel boxes with crude switches and wires hanging out of them as a test of concept, if you will, right? That opportunity to say, well, if I take this wire and I connect it to this circuit and I do this thing with it, will it do the thing that I'm pretty sure it's going to do? And after they have proven the concept, then they involve a designer and a marketing team in order to give us the finished product, the final version of that product. Now, they both do the same thing to a degree. The final product is going to have the bugs worked out of it that were maybe in the prototype, hopefully gone before it becomes the archetype. But there is a cruder, lesser version in the beginning, and that's how typology works. So we have Isaiah, who is a prophet, a mighty prophet of God. This is not to belittle Isaiah, but he is a type. He is a type of prophet that represents the greater prophet that would come, Jesus, who not only brings to us the word of God, but Jesus, who is the word of God. Not the one who would, in the presence of God the Father, say, woe to me, but the one who, in the presence of God the Father, would say, this is my right place at the right hand of the Father. Because he was not a man of unclean lips. And so the reason that this kind of works with Isaiah is because Isaiah is kind of the servant in that he is a forerunner. The lesser version that comes at the beginning. And the same is true with Israel. Israel is God's appointed, God's chosen. He selected them, set them apart. That idea exists ultimately in Jesus Christ. The Messiah, the set apart, the Christ, the one chosen. And so that they are lesser versions of the ultimate thing does not mean that they are the servant that is spoken of here. It means they are a type of this servant. And as we read on, we're going to see more and more where putting these types on the pedestal of seeing them as the servant talked about here will continue to fall short, and with it we are left with only Christ himself. Verse 5, we'll read it again because it needs to flow well into 6. And now the Lord says, He who formed me from the womb to be his servant, to bring Jacob back to him, and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord, and my God has become my strength. He says, It is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel, I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach the end of the earth. Isaiah spends a lot of time speaking to the nations. Isaiah is sort of a roller coaster of Israel is condemned for their sin and so they are being destroyed by foreign nations who will sin and be destroyed. But God will deliver. But first, everyone's going to be destroyed. But God will deliver. 
This is the roller coaster that is Isaiah, and right here we're on, we're on the upswing of that roller coaster. But Isaiah is never meant to be a light to the nations. He's a voice to the nations. Israel is told that they would be a blessing to the nations, but it never comes to pass. Verse 7, Thus the Lord, the Redeemer of Israel and His Holy One, to one deeply despised and whored by the nations, the servant of rulers, kings shall see and arise, princes they shall prostrate, before them, uh, they shall prostrate themselves because of the Lord who is faithful, the Holy One of Israel who has chosen you. Verse 8, thus says the Lord, in a time of favor, in a day of salvation, I've helped you. Now, I, I want to take a quick moment in this time of favor thing. There's an opportunity for us to read this in, where we would say, well, so what happened is these people did a good job. And because they did such a good job, they got a gift. And that's what it means in a time of favor. But that's, that's not the case. The, the case is this. God doesn't reward us with salvation. God looks to us in favor because He is gracious and merciful and not because we have achieved I heard a sermon just recently, and someone was preaching about how great a man Abram was when God called him to go and begin the nations. And to be perfectly clear, the only passages, the passages that lead up to the calling of Abram are just talking about how the world had turned to idolatry in the Tower of Babel. And then in the midst of it, there's Abram. There's no biblical evidence that he got to where he was to be the father of Israel because of his merit. God looked on him with favor because he was gracious and merciful. And in that same way, looking on mankind in a time of favor, a time where he has chosen to be gracious and merciful, he has provided a day of salvation. It says, I will keep you and I will give you as a covenant to the people. I will give you as a covenant to the people. That's, that's a big statement. Inside of the covenant with Israel, they are never offered. They are the recipients from God. They are told to bless the nations, but there's nothing about them becoming a gift. Isaiah, as mighty a prophet as he might have been, was still only a man and could not be a covenant gift. But on the night when Jesus was betrayed... He took the bread and he broke it. And he said, this bread is my body broken for you. Take, eat, and do this as often as you do so in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Take and drink and do so as long as you do so in remembrance of me. For as long as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Israel is brutally flawed. Throughout all of Scripture, she keeping her own history. Right? This isn't an outside people looking in on Israel and writing about all of the bad things that they did because they have something against them. This is Israel recording its own history, saying this is what God has done for us, and this is how we have failed him over and over and over again. Israel is failed and cannot be the covenant gift of salvation. 
Isaiah has already acknowledged that he doesn't belong in the presence of God, let alone to be a covenant gift to the nations. There must be another option. And that option is Jesus Christ, who not only fits the bill, but in that Last Supper claims the bill. He stands alone as the covenant gift for our salvation. And there's, there's a discussion about the land here. I want to I take a moment and talk about the prophecy and how it, it's working in this place. You see, prophets received messages from God and I firmly believe they spoke and wrote those messages without error as they were inspired by God himself. Yet, they were not all-knowing. That they perfectly preserved a message given to them by God does not mean that they knew all things constituted inside of that message. And there are going to be times when they are going to speak and not even understand what they're talking about because they're limited human beings. That's why we can take something like this and we can say, this works for Isaiah to a degree because he is a type and so it was useful for the Old Testament Christians. But we, on the other side of the cross, and after the teachings of Jesus, can look and say, oh man, there was so much more. This was talking ultimately about Christ himself all along. But in the same way that the speaker is limited, the audience is also limited. And so for Isaiah to come in here and make this fully messianic and fully New Testament and to stop talking about the land and to only stop, start talking about things like justification and sanctification and, and this spiritual kingdom that we are all a part of as believers would just be too much. It wouldn't make sense and it would seem to the original audience as if it were something other than the covenant promise and plan of God, which was ultimately tied to the land. And so here, when he talks about establishing the land, it's a, what we now know to be a metaphor, a spiritual gathering of God's people that is represented by the physical land that he gave in his first covenant. But he yet uses the servant to establish the land, and then he does this thing He apportions it. You remember when God divides up the promised land and he gives some to all of his people? He takes that land and he apportions it. And the desolate receive a heritage. In verse 9, he says to the prisoners, come out. To those who are in darkness, appear. They shall feed along the ways. On all bare heights shall, there, shall be their pastures. They shall not hunger or thirst, neither scorching wind nor sun shall strike them. For he who has pity on them will lead them, and by, uh, and by springs of water he will guide them. Why? Because the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters and he restores my soul for his name's sake. And I will make all my mountains a road and my highways shall be raised up. Behold, these shall come from afar. O coastlands, they will come from afar. And behold, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sion. Now I know that this first bit has been a bit different, a bit instructional. But without the knowledge, we can't fully appreciate and worship, and we don't have as strong of a foundation. We can be, we can be rocked and we can be shaken. People can come to us and they can say, well, what about these other options? And if we're not aware of those kinds of things inside of Scripture, then we're saying, maybe my pastor didn't know that those options existed. And maybe, or 
Even worse, maybe he did, and he pretended like they didn't exist because he didn't know how to answer the question. We become shaken in our faith. I've seen so many people from things like this fall out of Christianity and and back into Judaism. Or at least these sort of mixed forms of Christian Judaism that are not the worship of Christ as our deliverer. Not an understanding of that new covenant that we received in Him. You know, I've had them ask things like, well, what was the point in Israel anyway? Why not just send Jesus from the very beginning? Marshall and I talked about this, to be perfectly honest. I don't remember if it was on the podcast or before the podcast, because sometimes we chat and then we hit record. Uh, Thursday, you'll find out, I guess. Um, I, I really believe that if Jesus had offered to us grace and mercy from the very beginning, we would have said, okay, but you know what, if you'd have just explained it to me, I could have followed those rules. And Israel is multiple centuries of explaining to us, no, you wouldn't. (laughs) Because we're very much like them, right? Yeah, maybe we're ethnically different. Maybe we're geographically different. Maybe we have smartphones and they don't. But at the heart, we're the same. And Israel was an expression of you need to be rescued. Just like Israel needed to be rescued. But we come at it and we come to church sometimes and we think to ourselves, well, if you could just tell me right and wrong, give me right and wrong, and I'll take it from there. That's all I need, Pastor. Just, is this right or wrong? Point me in the right direction, and I'm off. The experiment with Israel tells us no. They had everything that you could want for and more in the expression of what is right and wrong, and they need a savior. They need to be rescued. Sometimes we think, well, all I need is an encouragement. I just need someone to encourage me and to inspire me. If we could just turn sermons into TED Talks, then then I would be inspired, and, and if I had that right motivation on a recurring basis, then I'd be ready to go. This is that time of year where long ago our appropriate motivations have fallen aside, right? Because in December, we know what's best for us and we set our charts to do what's right and we're super motivated. And here we are in March. And I, I would dare say that most of us have broken our New Year's resolutions. And some of us are sitting here right now going, I'm certain I've broken my New Year's resolution. If I could just remember what it was, I'd be able to tell you the degree with which I've broken my New Year's resolution. But for the life of me, I can't recall it. Why? Because understanding what's right, being motivated for righteousness, it's insufficient. Israel is an example of the fact that just being motivated, being set up and supplied, it's not enough. Isaiah, Isaiah is proof that just telling people what's right and wrong, it's not enough. But the servant, You notice in in the wording of how everyone becomes free from that thing that is burdening them. The servant doesn't come to them and say, if you follow my program, if you follow my instructions, I'm going to inspire you to a place where you can free yourself. No, he frees them so that it's not according to our own strength to follow the message that we've been given, but that we receive the gift of the thing that was done for us on our behalf. Once he has finished the work, paying the price for my sin, then he says to the, to the desolate, you are not on your own. You are not wandering this life on your own. You have a place in my family. This is your heritage. 
He says to the prisoner, I don't know what has you locked up or tied down right now. You could feel like emotionally, physically, spiritually tied up and locked down. The servant says to you, come out. Be freed from that. If you're in darkness, confused, appear. Come forward and be seen. You feel like you're in a place where you just can't get on top. That doesn't have to be a financial statement, guys. There's so many times in life where we feel like every step we take forward, the ground gives way under us and we slide back. And there's no hope for a future and all of the hills that we reside upon feel barren. And he says, I can make this place a pasture. And you will not be scorched by the winds or the sun. Verse 10 tells us why. Because he has pity on us. He sees us where we are, and he has pity on us. Now, Normally, what we do is this. This is the way sermons, or worship services generally go. We do sort of the upbeat stuff at the beginning, and then we, we tone it down a little bit with prayer, right? And that gets everyone nice and comfortable so that when the sermon starts, you're cozy and in your seat, and if you need to nod off, you're halfway there. And then we close it off with a, a reflection kind of a song that just lets us sit in a a humble and and reverent manner after the scripture and consider what it is that we've been told. I think that's appropriate. That's why we do that most Sundays. We want to do something different this week. Because when when I look through all of the things, that list of things that people are saved from, where where Christ as the servant says to his people, Come forth. Where those who were lost and confused in life, he says, I can, I am the light, and I can guide you. Wherever it is that you feel broken and trapped, I can relieve you of that struggle. Receive me and receive life. That is worthy of a celebration. And so what we're going to do is rather than closing in sort of a a quieter way, we're going to go out of here upbeat, and we're going to go out of here in a celebration. So I'm going to ask the band if they would come. We're going to stand together, and we're going to pray, and then we'll sing. So if the band comes, if you would, let's stand together. Father God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth and the encouragement that's in it. God, I thank you for your servant who died for us. And God, I I pray for everyone here that knows you. God, that they would be encouraged and lifted up by being reminded of all that you've done for us. God, I pray for anyone here that doesn't know you as their Savior, who might be watching online, who just sort of feeling this thing out. God, I pray that your spirit would move in them. God, and that today, for the first time, they would an- understand what it means to, to be victorious in this battle of life because someone has won on their behalf. And that they would worship with us what you have done for us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.